on Happy Sabbath. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Nice to see. I see. See the prob The problem, though, with saying people's names, then if you miss somebody, they feel, "Oh, Bill, you forgot me." So I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start going around and picking out people like Dan or Andy or Jerry or Daryl or Jackie or, you know, I'm not gonna do that. Because then I'm going to get myself into trouble, Eugene and Betty. I'm going to get myself into trouble if I do that. So I'm not going to do it. Curtis, don't have me do it, all right? Okay. All right. Glad we got that out of the way. You know, um, I have a friend up in Oregon. And uh, he tells me, he says, Bill, he says, wherever you go, you got to do something. I said, what's that, bud? He said, you got to tell the people stories. I said, stories? Stories about what, bud? He said, stories about things that God has done through the books that you've written, through, through the work that you've done. And I said, but bud, I don't like to do that. When I go and, and when I speak, I want to open the Bible and I, and I want to share truth with people. And he said, but Bill, he said, when people see what God has done, he said it lifts people up to say, well, if God can do that through Bill, he can do that through me too. And so, folk, I want to share a few stories tonight. And we're going to mix, as you're going to see, there's uh, several quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy and there's many, many Bible verses that have ministered to me in a very special way through various experiences I'm going to share tonight. And, um, but I just want to praise God for what He has done uh, because He's been so good. He's been so good. So the title, I call it Secret Terrorist Stories Once Upon a Time. Now let's take a look at this. Where will we stand? On some positions, this was something Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, on some positions, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that's neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it's right. That's a pretty powerful statement. Now, you know, I think we all have different feelings about Martin Luther King Jr., which is not the focal point of our meeting tonight. But what a powerful statement that he's made here. You know, we ask all kinds of questions when certain things come up. And we say, well, is this going to be a safe thing to do? Is it political? Is it popular? But when it comes down to it, folks, the one question we've got to ask ourselves is, is it right? And can I live with myself if I choose not to pick up this cross and bear it? Can I live with myself? You know, there was a welcoming party that was thrown by a Catholic periodical in Tangerine, Florida for the author of The Secret Terrorists. Um, in this little article, it's two pages, it alerted the Roman Catholics of Florida to have nothing to do with the author or the books, The Secret Terrorist and The Enemy Unmasked. Uh, the author, the editor, described in the paper all about Truth Triumphant and the trips that Hughes was taking across the world. And then she also wrote in the article to tell the Catholic League of New York to stop the work of Truth Triumphant. It's fascinating because I, on about three occasions, had opportunity to meet this lady. And um, the first time was in the little post office there in Tangerine, Florida, and I was mailing out material, and I had a bumper sticker that I had gotten from Harvest Time Ministries uh, with Vance Farrell. And it said, um, let's see, 
www.antichrist666.com. And I had that on my bumper. And um, I was in mailing out books and periodicals, and this lady came storming into the post office. And she was warm. And it wasn't summer in Florida. And she was still warm. She said, whose car is that out there? And I, I said, which car are you talking? Well, Tangerine Post Office folk is so little, you can't get many cars out in front of it. I knew whose car she was talking about. I said, ma'am, are you talking about the van? She said, yeah, the van. I said, that's my, my car. She said, who, who, who's that Antichrist 666 out there? I said, uh, ma'am, you need to go to that website. And you'll find out who it is. She said, no, I want you to tell me. Folk, she was fit to be tied. But you know what I found? She wanted to get in an argument. She was already fuming. She was fuming. And she wanted me to fume back. I wasn't going there. Because, folk, it's, it's, not, about, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about truth. That's what it's about. And who, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus Christ said that in John 14, 6, didn't he? So we can have all the truth in the world, but if we're obnoxious and rude and mean and hateful, what good is the truth that we have? not worth anything. So I determined as that lady started spewing venom my way that day, I said, I offered up a short prayer and said, Lord, help me to, to calmly answer this woman's questions and glorify your name. She fired back folk and said, no, I want you to tell me who that is. And I said, well, ma'am, you need to go to the website. I said, I could tell you, but I said, you need to, to look at all the points that the person makes on that website. Well, folks, she asked me again and again and again, and finally I said, fine. Fine. Do you want to know who it is? Well, she obviously was a Roman Catholic. And um, I said, ma'am, the characteristics of the Antichrist in the Bible... And I said, from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I said, the characteristics are as follows. It claims to be God on earth. It takes the titles of God. It claims it has power to forgive sins. It persecutes those who follow Christ. It, um, it changed the Ten Commandments. It completely annihilated the second and changed the day of worship or attempted to from Saturday to Sunday, I said, would you like me to go on? She said, who is the Antichrist? I said, ma'am, it's the Roman Catholic Church system. Well, then she about went through the ceiling. Now, folks, some people would say, Oh, but Bill, you, you, should, you shouldn't have done it that way. You know, you, you shouldn't have come right out and just popped it. Folk, there's a time, there's a time to hit something head on. There's a time to do that. And, you know, in our world today, we say, oh, but that's not politically correct. Or, oh, that's not kind. Folk. There were times in Jesus' ministry when he went pow, didn't he? Bethesda in John chapter 5, when he was accused of breaking the Sabbath, did Jesus back away and say, oh, okay, you know, maybe you're right? Did he do that? No, he confronted it graciously, kindly but firmly 
He confronted it. We've got to do the same thing. Christmas 2002, the Dominicans sent me a Christmas card letting me know that all hell would swim around my head for the two books. And, of course, the Christmas card said Merry Christmas. Um, you know, Revelation 15, 3 and 4, it says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So Revelation 15, 3 and 4 talks about a group of people that will gain the victory over the beast system, which is the Roman system, over his image, which is apostate Protestantism, over his mark, which is Sunday worship, and over the number of his name, which is 666. Stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Folk, there are a group of people right there that no matter what the Dominicans or what the Franciscans or what the Jesuits or what anybody says, they're going to be victorious. They're going to win in this world. And that means you and me. We have that opportunity. We can win, folks. We can win. No matter what the forces are. You know, in Great Controversy, pages 607 and 608, it says, The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. Thank you. You know, there's a gentleman that I'm on the radio with every Thursday morning. His, uh, the name of his program is Inquisition Update. And after every broadcast, he calls me on the phone. And he says, Bill, I just wish there were more listeners. And I said, Tom... What you and I need to concern ourselves with is being faithful with this radio station that God has entrusted you with. It's not a matter of how many listeners. That's not what's important. What's important is that we're faithful. And the reason I say that is because this statement right here in Great Controversy says that everybody is going to hear the truth of the three angels' messages. Everybody will. And it says, the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In amazement they hear the testimony that Babylon is a church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. As the people go to their former teachers with the eager inquirer, are these things so? The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, the popular ministry like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. Folk, that's awesome. You know, yesterday morning, and this has been brewing for quite a while on the radio program, we have enough listeners to create um, a little bit of a storm every now and then. And um, over the last three weeks, Tom wanted to talk about Daniel chapter 9 and the 490-year prophecy because he said, Bill, that completely smashes 
the futurist view that most evangelicals have today of Daniel chapter 9. Because they take the 70th week, they cut it off from the 69 weeks, and they put it down at the end of time. He said, Bill, would you present Daniel 9, 24 to 27? I said, be happy to. So we were going through it. And when I got all done, I said to the people, I said, you know, if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint program that I have on Daniel chapter 9, please email me and I'd be happy to send it to you. Well, folk, I had a half a dozen people within the next five or six hours emailed me and they all wanted a copy of it. Well, they're all non-Adventists. And um, at the end of this PowerPoint program, we go through the whole prophecy and then the very last slide of the PowerPoint program says, Ellen White was right. And then I quote from Great Controversy where she shows exactly how the 490 years was fulfilled. Well, this one evangelical Baptist woman, she went through the whole PowerPoint program and she saw that slide that said Ellen White was right. She said, he's an Adventist. He's, a, he's part of a cult. So she started e emailing me back and forth all last weekend. Going back and forth. And I said, her name was Mary Lynn. I said, Mary Lynn, what you need to do is study your Bible. She said, oh, I'm studying my Bible and I know you're a part of a cult. And I said, Mary Lynn, when have I ever presented anything on that radio program that I didn't back up right from Scripture? I said, I've never used Ellen White on those radio programs. I simply put it at the end of that PowerPoint program. She said, well, I'm going to go back and research it, but I know you're a cult. And I said, well, if you keep reading your Bible, you'll be okay. Well, then a couple of hours later, she wrote back to me and she said, I just listened to two tapes by Dale Ratzliff, an ex-Seventh-day Adventist minister, and I read a book by an evangelical by the name of Cloud, and they have convinced me that you're a cult. Well... Thursday morning at 11 o'clock, I got on the radio, that was yesterday, and um, I found out later on that Mary Lynn started calling at 10.30 because she wanted to get on and let everybody know what a wacko cult person I was. Well, folk, we got into the program, and about 15 minutes in, there was a phone caller. Well, it was Mary Lynn. And she just started blasting away. You're a cult member. You, Ellen White was a plagiarist. Ellen White was a woman. Women shouldn't speak in church. She went on and on and on. And she was warm too. Well, when she finally started to expire, I said, Tom, could I answer a few of those uh, statements that she's made. So we started going through the fact that a Catholic lawyer by the name of Vince Ramick proved that Ellen White was well within the confines of borrowing in her time that she was not a plagiarist. Well, the lady didn't like that. And then I asked her, I said, have you ever read the writings of Ellen White? The Desire of Ages, the Library of Congress says, was the finest book ever written on the life of Christ. I said, please read that book. I said, you know, the fact that Ellen White was a woman in 1 Corinthians 14 says that women shouldn't speak in church. I said, well, if, if you believe that women shouldn't speak in church and that Ellen White broke that, then I said, were you wearing a head covering last Sunday when you went to church? Because 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that. She says, excuse me, sir, but that was written for the people in Corinth. That wasn't written for today. I said, thank you very much. 
And neither was the principle in 1 Corinthians 14 about women speaking in church. Neither does that apply to today, whereas the principle of respect and decorum does apply. She didn't like that either. Folk, we have a message to share with people. Praise God. It's the truth. There's nothing better. Nothing better than the messages we've been given as Seventh-day Adventists. Nothing better. You know, Jesus in Matthew 28 said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore, Christ said, and teach all nations. Well, back home in our little group in our church there in Eustace, we took that literally like I know a lot of folk out here do too, and praise God for that. Praise God for the work of evangelism that a lot of folks here are doing. We started mass mailing Orlando, Florida with the book The Secret Terrorist. After the very first mailing, the ABC affiliate Channel 9 Eyewitness News came up to the little church that I have north of Orlando with their production truck and they brought their cameras in and this guy starts asking me question after question after question for 45 minutes. And uh, he basically said, you know, uh, Mr. Hughes, the people of Orlando say you're just a, a hateful man. That's why you wrote that book. And I said, well, sir, tell me something. When a hurricane is coming from the Atlantic and it's about to smack Florida and wipe out and destroy millions of people's lives, and Jeb Bush, who was then the governor, and, and Jeb Bush gets on the airwaves and tells the people of Florida, get out of the way, evacuate, go north. I said, do the people of Florida accuse Jeb Bush of being full of hate? And he looked at me and he said, well, of course not. And I said, and neither should they accuse me of it either. Because we have a hurricane. It's not out in the Atlantic. It's right here in the United States. It's in Washington, D.C. It's in government across this nation. And like a hurricane, it's destroying the people of this great nation. And I said, and I'm hateful because I'm telling people to wake up before it's too late. Well, he went back home and got on the air. And Channel 9, before they ever interviewed me, they knew already what they were going to say. They painted me out like I was some monster who had no right to a bulk mailing permit. They called me a hate monger and a man spreading hate literature. If you haven't heard that, folk, and you want to stand for what we believe is Seventh-day Adventist, if you haven't heard somebody call you that yet, I promise you they will. And actually, it's the highest of compliments. Because when you come right down to it, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 that we've been called to give to the world... Do you know how many of those messages would be considered hate in this political world we live in? 66%. Two-thirds of them, because the second angel's message says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, if we start pointing out who Babylon is, which are the apostate Protestant churches in Revelation 14.8 that fell in and around 1844, what do you think the evangelical uh, Protestants would call us? They'd say, you're full of hate, wouldn't they? They'd say, you're, you're a hate monger. Well, if you then go to the third angel's message and you say, if any man worship the beast and you identify who the beast is, and you say, that's Rome... Well, immediately, what have you become? A hate monger. Immediately, you're a hate monger. Well, folk, we have a choice to make. We're going to either continue to preach the truth, or we're going to step aside, and we're going to de deny Christ in the process. And that's the, that's the 
question you and I have got to ask ourselves. Because I don't like being called names. But if somebody's going to call me a name, and it comes down to whether or not I'm going to stand for the truth, because they're calling me names, well, by the grace of God, I'm going to stand for what is true. And they can call me anything they want. It's pretty clear why Orlando, Florida and Channel 9 immediately after our first mailing got on the air and said what a hateful person I was because we just kept right on going. And over 1.3 million souls heard the truth in Orlando and over 500 souls signed up for Bible studies including a state representative and a judge. Now that's why the devil did not want us mailing Orlando, Florida. Because folk, we had, like it says, we have over 500 people that are in our Bible study program from Orlando, Florida, learning the truths of Daniel, Revelation. Folk, it is thrilling. And why are we here? But to spread our messages. That's why we're here. The Catholic Churches of Orlando tell the Central Florida Postmaster to stop the mailings of the secret terrorist and the enemy unmasked. You know, I was told after we started mailing that if you got up in a plane or a helicopter and you looked down over the city of Orlando, that you could see five huge Catholic churches that surround the city. Well, I've never seen that. Of course, I've never looked either. But folk, that can't stop us from doing and spreading the truth that we know. You know, I have a lot of people say, well, Bill, I'd like to do evangelism in the town where I live, but there's so many Catholics. But Jesus said, go ye into all the world, didn't he? And don't Roman Catholics, aren't they a part of all? Yeah, they are. So the Central Florida Postmaster... <clears throat> was told by the Catholic Churches of Orlando to stop the mass mailings of the secret terrorist and the enemy unmasked. The Central Florida Postmaster contacted the little post office in Eustis, Florida and told this Central Florida Postmaster in Orlando that, that Hughes had every right to mass mail his books. Incredible. Incredible. In this time, folk, when people are scared to death over their jobs, and this postmaster in little Eustis, Florida, who's nearing retirement, he knows he could lose a ton. And he stands up and he tells the central Florida postmaster, Hughes has every right to, to send out those books. Leave him alone. Unbelievable. Praise God. He's still at the helm, folk. He's still at the helm. The next step when they couldn't stop us mass mailing books, I started having my post office box filled with every magazine you can imagine from every company under the sun, from U.S. News to Time to Newsweek to uh, Birds and Butterflies to Modern Technology to... You name it, people and everything you can imagine. And they had all different kinds of names on them, from uh, Tommy Jesuit to uh, Billy, Billy Buffer to, uh, uh, you know, just the weirdest names. And they all came to my post office box. It's mind games, folks. Mind games. And while people are attacking the secret terrorists and the enemy unmask, our little Bible study program is growing to a thousand souls learning the truths of the Bible. Praise God. Praise God. Every, every week when I would get up in church back home, I would hold up these little cards that we would insert in every book and I'd, 
I, you know, we'd have six or we'd have 10 or we'd have 15 cars that had come in that week. And I'd look at the folks and I'd say, you know, in this television, junk food um, society in which we live, it's a miracle if we get one card of somebody that wants to know the truth. But praise God, he's giving us five and he's giving us 10 and he's giving us 15 cards at one time. There's folk out there. Others are coming to the Advent message, getting baptized as a result of reading the books. I get calls from people in Hawaii, Tennessee, California, Oregon, Maine, all over the United States, and of course around the world. Praise God. For the earth, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's awesome, folks. That's how I can say with such confidence to this gentleman Thursday morning, Tom, this truth that we are sharing here, it is going to go to every person on this planet. Let's just be faithful with that which God has given to us. Oh. <laughs> How did he get in there? My dear friend out in Oregon, Bud, he called me and he said, Bill, we've got to do a mass mailing and we're going to then have you come out and speak. Well, we did the mass mailing. It was to Myrtle Point and uh, Coquille and Bandon, Oregon. It was about 11,000 homes. After the books hit, you would have thought a cyclone had gone through those towns. Pre there was a Catholic priest in the area. Pastors in southern Oregon spoke out against the mass mailings of the secret terrorists, calling it hate literature. Riots were threatened if Hughes showed up. One evangelical minister likened Hughes to Adolf Hitler denouncing him. The minister's real problem was over the issue of the Sabbath. Uh, the priest showed up for the meeting with a lady friend and he was not happy. Now you say, but Bill, why does it say hello? Is this Adolf? Um, a good friend of mine back home in Florida, he, after this mass mailing and the people saying I was like Adolf Hitler, uh, he would call me on the phone and he'd say, uh, uh, is, is this uh, Adolf Hitler speaking? Am I speaking to Adolf Hitler? So, what an amazing time that was, folk. Um, amazing time. You say, well, I'll bet you, Bill, you just jumped on that plane and headed straight out to speak. Folk, I was scared. I was scared. These people in the newspaper, who shows up, we're going to surround that bit. We're going to have a riot. We're going to have a riot in that, in that uh, fairgrounds building. Those people were, they were out for blood. I'm, The thing that helped me to get on that plane, the mass mailing was about three or four weeks before the meetings. These verses, Psalm chapter 17 and verse 8, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 17 verse 8. And a man, this is Isaiah 32, verse 2, a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the other one does not have a verse. I missed it. It's Isaiah 25, verse 4. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress. A refuge from the storm 
a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Each of those verses has one word in common. Did anybody catch it? There's one. What's the word that's mentioned in each of those verses? Was refuge mentioned? Shadow. Shadow. You know, right at the time that we did the mailing and I was heading out there, it was just starting to turn miserably hot in Central Florida. And every Sabbath, I'd pull up to church, I'd park my car right there in front of the front door. And I noticed that everybody else that was coming to church, see, our parking lot is such that it's out in the country. And so uh, there's an open area for parking, but then beyond that, there are a bunch of trees that line the parking area. Well, of course, the trees would give shade. And I noticed everybody in the church, nobody was parking next to my car. And I thought, I, never happened like that before. And I thought, well, why are they doing it? Well, obviously, it was so hot, they were parking them under the shade to get away from the heat. And, folks, that's exactly what those verses say. That Jesus Christ, when the heat is on, Jesus Christ will be our shadow. Amen. He will be that cooling place where we can turn when nobody else will hear. He will be there. And He will enable us to do what we can't do. Because humanly speaking, folk, I really... I'm. Some people say, well, Bill, you know, you wrote those books. You've got to be a masochist. No, I'm not. I believe they're true. I believe the world needs to be warned. But I don't, I don't walk in front of a, of a truck so it can run over my head. I don't find pleasure in that. But it was these verses that ministered to my heart and gave me the courage and the strength to go to Southern Oregon. I remember when I was picked up in Eugene and when we arrived at the campground there at Myrtle Point, uh, Bud, my dear friend, he said, uh, I guess he was trying to encourage me, he said, hey Bill, did you notice the white truck behind us? It's been following us since you, we got picked up since we picked you up in Eugene. I said, oh, thanks, bud. <laughs> I guess it's already started, hasn't it? We got to the auditorium, the fairgrounds auditorium. I had no idea what to expect. I thought they said in the paper there was going to be a riot. The tension in the auditorium, when I walked in, you could have cut it with a knife. Uh, the priest, I don't, I guess I mentioned, the, the priest came who had gotten in the newspaper and had denounced the book so uh, vociferously. He walked in, and I knew, of course, everybody did, that he was a priest. He had a great big cross around his neck, and there was a woman accompanying him. And they went in and sat down, and um, I thought, well, my, he's a soul just like anybody else. He needs to know the three angels' messages like anybody else. I walked in. I went over. And I, I went, Good evening, sir. My name's Bill Hughes. What's yours? Now, folk, have you ever been around somebody when they get real nervous and their, the, the muscles in their jaw starts to twitch? Have you seen that? Or you felt it in your own life but sometime when you get real nervous and the muscles in your cheeks, you just can't control them. Well, I'll tell you, the, the muscles in that man's cheeks when he heard who I was, he couldn't control them. He was very, very upset to have met Bill Hughes. But I said, sir, it's great to meet you. Glad, glad you're here. 
And then I shook the woman's hand and went to the back to get ready for the meeting. That night, we preached. I preached on Revelation. That it was a book about Jesus Christ and the light, and it was on the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. We went into folk the issue of Sabbath Sunday. The Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to redeem. Sunday, a sign of rebellion. We went into the beast power, and I said, what, what group, what church has exalted Sunday worship? And I read three or four quotes right from Catholic sources, and the Catholic priest is sitting right there with, his, with this woman. Well, there's a bunch of people surrounding them. And at a point in the meeting, the woman turns to the Catholic priest. I was told this later. I couldn't hear her, of course. She said, she said, Hughes is nuts. He doesn't know what he's talking about concerning Sabbath and Sunday. And the Catholic priest turned to the woman and said, don't be so sure about that. Now, folk, the Catholic priest was convicted that the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. Amen. He was convicted of that truth, and he told this woman so right there with a bunch of Seventh-day Adventists sitting around them. He was convinced of that truth. I don't know what he's done with it since. But folk, is that not why we're here? It's the most fearful warning Dwayne ever given. Absolutely. But it's got to go, folk, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that includes Roman Catholics. And we know from great controversy that most of God's people are in her communion or in the evangelical apostate Protestant churches. In other words, the priest was convinced. The priest knew the truth of Scripture. There are real Christians in the Roman Catholic Communion. Great Controversy 565. And Great Controversy 566 says, The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. That's our job, folks. After the meeting, a good friend of mine was taking film of the, product, of the program that night. He came up to me and he said, Pastor Bill, how long are you going to be around tonight? Can I get a picture of you with the priest? I know exactly what I'll use as the caption for the picture. Folk, I was exhausted. I looked at him and I said, what caption would you have for your picture? He said it would be beauty and the beast. <laughs> that was pretty good. After the meeting, the priest told the people, in spite of ecumenical efforts for unity in this country, there will be persecution in the near future. That's what he told the people. That's what he told the people. I think before that, before that meeting, before that mass mailing, that priest and the priests of Rome had gotten the idea that their ecumenical efforts for unity in America and around the world were so complete, were so complete, that nobody would dare to speak against Rome. But after that meeting and after that mass mailing, the priest told the people that gathered around him after the meeting, there will be persecution in this country. Because he sensed that there were a group of people from that mailing and in that room that would resist the authority of Rome. He knows that God's people will rise and refuse the ecumenical movement. Well, some will rise. Great Controversy, page 608. Notice this incredible statement. It says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, 
abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they've come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they're prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren when, when Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith. These apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. You know, back in 19, um, 1988, I was pastoring in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South Lake Tahoe, California. I was a pastor and teacher. And I got up one day in Sabbath school, and I read this quote uh, off the top of my head. I didn't have the book in front of me. And the way I stated it was, the part where it says they abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition, I paraphrased it and I said, uh, they leave the church and join the ranks of the opposition. Well, there was an elderly retired Adventist minister who was sitting in the very back of the church that morning. And later on, he told me, he said, Bill, I have not been in an Adventist church in 20 years. I said, why did you come to church today? He said, because the Spirit of God said, go to that church. You're going to hear things today in that church that you haven't heard for a long, long time. Well, folk, as soon as I misquoted this, not intentionally, but I misquoted it, he raised his hand in the back. I acknowledged him. He said, son, he said, you misquoted that passage. I said, I don't believe I did, sir. He said, I know you did. So I said, well, that's fine. Let's get out great controversy and I'll read it. Well, you know what, folks? He was right. I did misquote it. Because the passage does not say they leave the church. It doesn't say that. It says they abandon their position on our messages. That's what it says. But they stay right in the organized church. That's what the statement says. It says, again, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message. It's obvious it's talking about God's professed people but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. They stay right in the church, but they embrace the false teachings of ecumenism. Got a letter from a guy in Blantyre, Malawi. Malawi's in, of course, South Central Africa. It's just north of um, the Republic of South Africa, uh, right next to Mozambique, as you can see on the map, Zambia, Tanzania. Uh, let's see, here's Zambia, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, and then Malawi. Got a letter from a guy in Blantyre, right down here. Blantyre, Malawi. He said... I was handing out the secret terrorist and the enemy unmasked on the streets of Blantyre. A man came up to me and said, do you know what you're handing out? The gentleman said, yes, I do. The man replied then, he said, those books contain material that people are not supposed to know at this time. Those books should be burned. Interesting. While people are attacking the books, the Bible study program is swelling to over 2,000 enrollees. Praise God, Peter. Absolutely, Pete. Baptisms into the Advent message, souls being awakened to the footsteps of the Antichrist are reaching into the thousands. Praise God. A radio host becomes a Sabbath keeper. An ex-CIA agent does the same. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Pseudo-Adventist pastors denounce secret terrorist enemy unmasked as not in harmony with Adventist teachings. In newspaper um, 
from mass mailings. Adventist pastors would go into the newspapers and they would say, we believe in the second coming, we believe in health, we believe in loving our neighbor, we believe in the Sabbath, we believe in sharing the love of Jesus with the whole world. But then they leave out the second and third angel's messages. We did another mass mailing. This time it was to Coos Bay and Reedsport, Oregon. They're right next to Coquille, Bandon, and Myrtle Point. Well, the Catholic priest got into the newspaper again, and then he showed up at the meetings that Sabbath in the uh, library conference room. And his female companion showed up too, and then... That afternoon, of course, the room was jammed. There were a lot of people there in that library conference room. After the meeting, the meeting was on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, That ye be not soon troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter is from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see, the people in Thessalonica thought Jesus was coming in the first century, and Paul said, "Ah, uh -uh, he's not coming now. He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the advent of Christ shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now the man of sin, the word there for sin is the, the word we get antinomian from. It actually reads the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition. These were the words that were used to describe only one other person in all of the Bible. Who was it? Judas, Judas Dwayne, that's right. Judas in John 17 was called the son of perdition. And then it goes on, it says, Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Now, where, where do you think Paul preached from to preach this message to the people at Thessalonica? Because Paul only had the Old Testament, didn't he? The New Testament hadn't been written yet. So from what passage in the Old Testament did Paul gather about a man of lawlessness who would change the Ten Commandments and would exalt himself above God or, or all that is called God? Daniel 7. Daniel 7, that's right. Paul preached to the Thessalonians from Daniel 7 about the man of lawlessness who would think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25, that's right. Well, I preached on that Sabbath afternoon and after the meeting was over, I reached down, my briefcase was right there next to me, and I reached down my Bible in my briefcase and I stood up like this, and there she was. No, she wasn't that close. I would say, there, give her 20, 24 inches. She had some buddies, one on either side of her. I could pretty much identify where she was coming from. She had a very large cross chain around her neck with a cross in the middle. And folk, if looks could have killed, I wouldn't be here today. So I had a pretty good idea where she was coming from. She said, don't you ever, don't you ever say that the papacy is the antichrist of scripture again. Folks, she was livid. 
Oh, Dwayne. She was furious. And I believe she expected when she said that for me to say, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I apologize. I looked at her and I said, Ma'am, as long as there is blood flowing through my veins, I will preach this truth. She was horrified. Not only had I preached from 2 Thessalonians 2 and identified this man of sin as the papal system, you know, and I made it very clear in the meetings. I said, folk, this is not about Roman Catholic individuals. And I said, there are many dear Roman Catholic people that are living up to all the light they know. I said, we're talking here about a system that has attacked everything that God has stood for. Made that very clear. Folk, when I told her I would continue to preach that, She didn't say another word to me. See, she didn't come up to discuss something with me. This was an ultimatum. When she didn't get what she wanted, she turned and she was out of that building in a flash. And her buddies were right behind her. What's that? I believe so. I believe so. No question. Do we stop telling the truth? A trucking company brought us some books from New York. We get our books printed up in New York. At the Georgia-Florida border, the truck was stopped by the local authorities at the Georgia-Florida border. And the truck driver, who had never had that happen before, he said, what, what do you want to look in my truck for? I've, I've come down from New York down here to Florida many, many times. You've never done this before. Why are you doing it now? The authorities said, we need to keep an eye on an extreme group in Florida that mails out hate literature. Now you say, now Bill, how would you know that? You weren't there at the border. Well, the truck driver, when he got out of his truck right there at our little church in Eustis, Florida, when he got out of the truck, he came right over to me. He said, what, what, kind of stuff, what kind of stuff is in this truck that I'm carrying for you? He said, I got these from a book company. What kind of books are these? I said, let's get them out and you can have a copy. He said, I can't wait. <laughs> so we gave him some of the books and I went inside, got him a Steps to Christ. National Sunday Law, got him some DVDs of Walter Weith, and he was a happy camper on his way. <laughs> Rome works. We need to work. Great Controversy 565, 566. The Roman Church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She's employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground on every side. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her colleges and seminaries in America so widely patronized by Protestants. I think there's over 200 Catholic schools in the United States. Look at the growth of ritualism in England and the frequent defections to the ranks of the Catholic. These things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. That's our work. That's our work. 
Got a letter from the government seat where our capital is in Tallahassee, Florida. It was a letter that said they were getting complaints about our mass mailings. And they asked me to stop. They knew they had no legal grounds to make me stop. So they asked me to stop. I wrote back to them and I told the people in Tallahassee that all I am trying to do is to help people to understand the truth of the Bible, the times in which we live, and for people to be ready for Jesus when he comes. Yeah. Tallahassee has never written back. Recently I had the privilege to go to Central America and had some meetings in Costa Rica and Panama. Um, the first Sabbath I was there, a woman came up to me. She was a devout Catholic. She told me her story. She was working for the World Bank, its branch in Costa Rica. This woman declared to me that Several years ago, she became alarmed by the reports of pedophile priests in Costa Rica. Being an intelligent woman that she was, very highly educated woman, she began to do research. In her research, someone out of the blue handed her a book called Los Terroristos Secretos. She begins to read and realizes that the author, while writing about United States history, is actually describing what is happening in her home country right before her eyes. She was shocked. She begins to copy the book in Costa Rica and downloads the book onto her computer at her job. Then one day, she went into work and there was somebody else sitting at her desk. And when she asked them what they were doing at her desk, they responded they were now doing her job. That her services were no longer needed at the World Bank. Folks, she was handing out the secret terrorists all around the World Bank in Costa Rica. She, doubt, she was making copies of the book in Costa Rica and she had downloaded the book onto her computer. She is today a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Praise God. She is a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian today. As of this date, there are over 2,250 souls in our Bible study program via the mass mailings that we have done of the secret terrorists and the enemy unmasked. We have most recently now started using a brochure that um, has also been doing a very good job. Baptisms unknown have resulted from the books. Praise God, the work goes on. The cause still lives, the hope endures, and the dream shall never die. Folk, as I get on this radio program on Thursday and deal with evangelicals and talk to people who are Sunday keepers, There is mass confusion out there. And you and I are privileged. We are privileged to have the Bible and the writings of Ellen G. White. We are so privileged. We have so much to be thankful for tonight. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your great love to us. Thank you 
Thank you for the opportunities that are still ours to share your truths as far and wide as we can. Father, thank you for the precious light from the spirit of prophecy as manifest in the writings of Ellen White. Thank you for that amazing gift. Father, we just pray tonight that you would strengthen each and every one of us to light a fire, to go to the ends of the earth to tell of Jesus Christ and his precious messages for this hour. Please, Father, light that flame in our midst and send us on our way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.